And I invite you to stand as you're able for our call to worship. <clears throat> Today it's taken from Psalm 121 and can be found in the hymnal 844 or on the screen as well. <clears throat> I lift my eyes to the hills. From whence does my help come? The Lord will not let your foot be moved. The Lord who keeps you will not slumber. The Lord is your keeper. The, Lord is the, shade on your right hand. the sun shall not smite you by day. The Lord will keep you from all evil and will keep your life. Our first hymn is 451, Be Thou My Vision. yet to do. Lord, we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who willingly died on that cross, so we all have the opportunity for salvation and eternal life. Lord, may we always be mindful of uh, how we are to be and to do and to carry out your word and your will in our lives that will bring honor and glory to you. We bring all of these things before you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. <laughs>
let us turn to the Lord in prayer. Gracious God, we come before you thanking you for each day that you give to us. Lord, we, we pray that we see them as blessings. Uh, we pray that we see them as opportunities and possibilities of, of uh, sharing the good news of Jesus Christ in whatever form that takes and that we reach out to others and uh, uh, just be there uh, to be your love and your light and your grace uh, shining through us as we are your sons and daughters, as we are your brothers and sisters in Christ. Lord, we thank you for that. We lift up those folks uh, in the Tennessee area who have uh, lost their homes, who have lost their possessions, but especially, Lord, those who have lost loved ones. Uh, and apparently there were some that were uh, multiple members, uh, not just one, but a, a couple of members of a family. Uh, and so, Lord, we just pray that you will undergird those families uh, and help them with their grief and the uh, enormity of trying to rebuild and to, uh, for many, start over again. Just be with them, Lord. Help them in their time of need. And Lord, we, I ask too that you uh, continue to be with those who are hurting, with the, uh, the Stahl family, with the Johnston family, uh, and the care that they are providing for their loved ones. We just pray, Lord, that uh, those who are experiencing the health concerns um, will get relief and there can be the, the treatments that's needed and hopefully that takes care of issues as well. But we know, Lord, that it can be, and it has been for some, a very long road. We just pray, Lord, that they not lose hope, that they not uh, be uh, overly discouraged, uh, and understand that there are many praying for them and concerned about them. Uh, and so we lift them before you. We pray, Lord, that Dan can find relief and get uh, some answers for his situation and for the, the sharing. Uh, indeed, we are a family. We are uh, this church family. So uh, we just thank you for that. And we just uh, thank you, Lord, for uh, situations that we may not even think about or spend a whole lot of time uh, pondering. But Lord, we just <clears throat> may we be mindful that your love and your grace is with us always. Um, and there are many things that we take for granted. But as we continually discover that life is fragile, uh, life is special. Um, and so we just thank you for each day you give to us. And may we uh, take time to give you thanks and praise for um, our lives and how you touch our lives. And may we come to you not just when we have needs and concerns, but also the times of our joys and celebration. Lord, we also know that there are those who have uh, health concerns and there's not a resolution yet. We just pray that as they continue to seek help, that there will be uh, help that comes and uh, a determination of what's causing the, the health issue uh, or issues and that they can find relief as well. Lord, for all of us, we just thank you and praise you. We ask the Lord that uh, we are, are cautious uh, and careful uh, with the, not only the coronavirus that is getting so much attention, but uh, the flu and colds and all of those things that, that come around. Uh, may we be mindful of uh, others and be respectful uh, of uh, situations that are, are there. Lord, we also pray that you continue to uh, touch us in uh, countless ways as we reach out to you and as others reach out to us uh, in the sharing of, of the good news of Jesus Christ. And Lord, we just bring all of these things before you with the confidence that you are there, you hear our prayers, um, and you answer them. And Lord, we just give you all the thanks and praise for these things and all things. And we bring them all before you in Jesus' precious name who taught us to pray. Our Father, 
who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. from Genesis uh, chapter 12, one to four, the call of Abraham. The Lord had said to Abraham, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you I will curse and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abraham went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. This is Romans 4, verses 13 through 16. It was not through the law that Abraham and his offspring received the promise that he would be heir of the world, but through the righteousness that comes by faith. For if those who depend on the law are heirs, faith means nothing, and the promise is worthless, because the law brings wrath, and where there is no law, there is no transgression. Therefore, the promise comes by faith, so that it may be by grace and may be guaranteed to all Abraham's offspring, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who have the faith of Abraham. He is the father of all of us. This is the word of God for the people of God. Let all of God's children say, Amen. Thank you, Angela. A giving of our whole heart, soul, mind, and strength to God. That's what being a faithful follower is all about, stepping out in faith. The Old Testament passage, as we heard Angela share with us, is about Abram, who later was known as Abraham or was given the name of Abraham, is a great example of this, uh, stepping out in faith. We see that God calls him to leave all things familiar, his country, his people, his father's household, and to go to a land that God would later show him. <clears throat> so how many of us would pick up and leave everything that we are accustomed to, that we're comfortable with, and go to, well, who knows where at that point? Um, but that's exactly what Abram did. In faith, he took his wife, uh, Sari, who later was renamed Sarah, their nephew Lot and his family and their possessions and the people they had acquired uh, with them. So they didn't leave empty handed, 
But still, <clears throat> Abram went out uh, in faith to an uncertain future that lie ahead. And he did so in complete obedience and trust in the Lord. We are told in verse 4 that Abram left as the Lord had told him. And now God did make seven promises to him. Uh, and they are, I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great. You will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. Whoever curses you, I will curse. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Pretty significant promises that could really stroke egos of some people uh, who might be just daydreaming about all of that control, all of that power that they would attain. But these promises were not the motivating factors, were not the influence for Abram. Paul explains in the Romans passage the promises that were made to Abraham and that were carried out to his descendants did not come through the law. Rather, they came about through the righteousness that comes by faith. Righteousness that comes by faith. Paul goes on to say that faith uh, comes by grace. So all of this is planted into the hearts and to the minds and souls and strength of those who believe. The Apostle Paul tells the church in Rome that Abraham was justified by his faith and that his faith is credited as righteousness. Abraham did this because he did it in faith and in obedience, uh, but not from the perspective of becoming famous. Now, the Jews of Jesus' time used Abraham as an example of justification by works, but Paul holds him up as a shining example of righteousness by faith. Huge difference. Justification by works, righteousness by faith. Hebrew 11, 8 tells us, by faith Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed, went, and even though he did not know where he was going, uh, he did so in faith. So it was this prompt obedience that was grounded in faith that characterized uh, Abraham throughout his life. And his actions are what we are all supposed to do. We are to go in faith, no matter what God's calling may be in our lives. Sometimes God's way is not necessarily the easiest way or the most popular path to take. But Jesus reminds us in Matthew 7, enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many enter through it, but small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. So our rewards, our blessings are beyond our imagination, uh, and they are given to those who will travel uh, God's path. The, the narrow way. Uh, I think maybe because of, of where I live now, um, that the, the road isn't totally narrow, but when a, a larger piece of equipment comes the opposite direction, um, and I'm talking usually farm equipment, depending how big that is, you pull over, you pull into a person's driveway, because they are massive, some of them. Um, they are big. Um, so um, we need to, to be on that narrow road, that narrow path. And, and we know a lot of times there's curves and there's hills and there's valleys and there's um, all kinds of things. We can get on the, the super highways, the, the um, uh, interstates, and there can be two, three, four, five, six lanes, you know, and, and just massive. Um, but sometimes I always chuckle because I'm not in it when they call it rush hour, and all you see are these cars sitting there, going nowhere. It, it becomes a huge parking lot. And I know sometimes on the newscast they show, and also either, depending on which direction, you see a stream of white lights, or you see a stream of red lights. Uh, looks pretty at Christmas time, but if you're in the middle of that, it's not pretty no matter what time of, of year it is. So, but that's the, the broad way. We are uh, encouraged and uh, 
we have to, to travel the narrow road. Uh, sometimes it, it's difficult uh, to travel, but we also know um, that God is always with us. He's cheering us on um, as we faithfully serve him. And then when we come to the end of our uh, earthly journey, we will be greeted by Christ himself. And when we carry out, when we live our lives faithfully, we will hear this greeting, well done, good and faithful servant. So to go in faith means that we must put our faith into action. I mean, go is an action word. Uh, and that also involves obedience. It does no one any good to have faith, but to do nothing with it. James chapter 2, verse 17 says, Faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. Verse 22 goes on to say, You see, Abraham's faith and his actions were working together, and his faith was made complete by what he did. Abraham was filled with faith when he obediently went where God instructed him to go. But how about us? How about you? Are we being faith-filled and faithful to God's call in our lives? Are we going out in faith to do those things God has laid on our hearts to carry out? Oh, by the way, I... I didn't warn the first service, but I'll give you a little warning. I'm, I, I'm going to start getting into a territory where usually pastors have said, stop meddling and just preach. Um, but I, I may be meddling, but I'm okay with that. Um, so now since I've warned you, you're going to say, okay, I'm going to hang on tight. I'm going to put on my seatbelt, and I'm going to just go for the ride. Um, but are we doing the things God has laid on our heart to do? Have we even asked the Lord what it is that he wants us to do? Collectively and individually, we at the church need to change the way we think about things and do things as a, as a church. I'm going to quote from a class description that is being offered this coming Saturday at Audubon United Methodist Church in Hagerstown. Um, it was offered. I sent out an email blast from the office letting you know that this was taking place, this leadership training day, that's what they used to call it. I forget now the name they call it, but uh, a great opportunity for lots of classes that are there, lots of opportunities. Um, and then um, I'll give credit to the credit that's there. Uh, Nancy Jones sent out a, another one uh, geared more directly to chairpersons and to the, the church council and to staff, uh, challenging us to, to sign up to take these classes. Um, I don't know if people signed up uh, online and not go through a, a, you know, a particular channel. You signed up yourself. Praise the Lord if you did. But I know from those two emails that were sent out, I think maybe three responded uh, for that. Uh, but let me just share this, this one class offering. It's too late to sign up now, and you can't walk in to do it. Um, but when there's an offering made like that, I, I, I hope we are serious about um, what we are doing and as uh, followers of Jesus Christ. This, this particular class is entitled New Faith Expressions, Being a Sent People Instead of an Attractional Church. And so I'm quoting this. Are you looking to breathe new life into your congregation? Is your church shaped by worship or programs? children or youth ministries or by their preferences of your current members? What if your church was shaped by the mission of making disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world? What if your church was shaped by the mission of reaching people who currently don't attend any church? For decades, churches have operated from the mentality of build it and they will come. I add preach it and they will come. But they say build it and they will come. So what is it? Perhaps it is a new building, or worship service, or maybe the best coffee, or the latest program. We have spent countless hours and resources trying to attract people <clears throat> to our churches and have them come to us. Instead of come to us, what if we embraced a new approach, go to them? What if we embody 
Christ's commandment in Matthew 28, 19, go therefore and make disciples. It is time for us to discover new expressions of church that are able to communicate with a culture that is not currently a part of the church so that they can become committed followers of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> we are at a crossroads as our society and culture continue to undergo massive <clears throat> transitions that have affected the church. These challenges provide us with a significant opportunity to reach new people. It begins by changing our focus beyond our building and the come to us approach and embrace the we will go to you attitude embodying the gospel where people are rather than embodying it where we are and in ways we prefer. <clears throat> we need to rethink things. I heard, I think, before worship service, a gasp. It's like, whoa, where's everyone at? I counted, and there's less than 40 at this service. There was 14 at the first service, and the third service is about the same number. Last Sunday, for a while, the praise team outnumbered the folks sitting in the congregation. We, and, and the reason I share this is that all of us, all of us need to have a change of attitude. I'm not trying to paint a doom and gloom kind of message. And for those of you who are visiting, maybe for the first time or for a while, um, it's not also unique to Walkersville United Methodist Church. It's not unique to the United Methodist denomination. Yes, I know the big elephant for United Methodists is the whole human sexuality thing. But you know, there are times we have to set that aside and see what's going on on in a daily basis. Because my concern is if we continue to do church the same way it's been done for years. And there again, please understand, I'm saying we, so I'm included in this. I have some of the same hang-ups or struggles as we seem to have. But if we continue to do church the same way, our future is bleak. And this is a reality check. I'm not trying to scare anyone. But <clears throat> this was laid on my heart, so I'll, I'll give the credit to God. Uh, if you have a concern, yeah, I know you're going to come talk to me. But anyway, I'm trying to stay focused on this. It's everyone. It's all of our responsibility. Not just me as the pastor. Not just for one or two or maybe a handful of other folks. The saying used to be about 20% of the people do 80% of the work. I don't have anything to back it up, but I say it's changed. I say it's about 10% of the people do 90% of the work. And, and it's more than just showing up for Sunday mornings or in our committee meetings or church council meetings to discuss ideas. We are great at discussing. We get ourselves so worked up and we pat ourselves on the back. Wow, we just discussed a great thing. And then we meet in two more months, and we rediscuss it, and we say we did a great thing, but we didn't do a thing. Now, please don't misunderstand. There is ministry that's going on. There is missions that's taking place. We're not all just setting by, but there's more that we can do. There's, there's. I, I appreciate. Nancy's challenge, and I'm sorry, Nancy, I don't mean to be um, uh, embarrassing you, but you are glowing in the light there uh, <laughs> uh, that God's placed on you. Um, but I appreciate that, that challenge. We, we need to understand that there's more that we can do. We don't match our neighborhood. We're basically all one color. And probably, 
about the same social status and all of those kind of things. Um, you know, so and again, I'm saying I'm just as guilty as anyone else. But please don't put the blame on the pastor. Please look inside the, the season of Lent I talked about last Sunday. We are to do a self-examination, an honest self-examination. Where are we doing well? But where are some challenges that we can work on? We're struggling. There are concerns that are there. We aren't necessarily going out. We seem to be waiting for those folks to come to us. And once in a while, we have someone who will come to us. Um, but we need to be reaching out. Uh, we need to understand and, and maybe rethink how we do the Lord's work. Okay, I think you can unbuckle the, the seatbelts. Our faith and our action must be interlocked with one another. We need to have faith. And we need to have action. We need to have action and we need to have faith. It's obvious that Abraham's faith was in sync with God's desire. And I, and I think about, even remember when Abraham, when God told Abraham to take your son Isaac up to a mountain and he was stretched out and Abraham had his knife raised, ready to thrust it into his son. That's how obedient Abraham was. He was willing to sacrifice his own son. That's how faithful he was to God. God provided a ram. But Abraham's faith was in sync with God's desire. All throughout Abraham's life, we see how strong his faith was and how in tune he was with God's calling in his life. If we are not in that right, close relationship with God, then for certain our faith will also be out of alignment with him. Corrective measures call for our repentance, seeking God's forgiveness and being reconciled to him. Again, that's what I shared. That's what Lent is about, is a looking at ourselves uh, being reconciled, seeking forgiveness, living that this life. Please, I don't want to end on such a, a down note that we aren't doing things. We are doing things. We are going in faith. But there's so much more that we could do. And the, the responsibility could go and should go over a whole lot more uh, than just a handful of folks. Thanks be to God. Amen.
say amen on that one? Amen. Amen. There's devotion right there coming, shining through, baby. 